So the legend tells us all about the Queen Dihia of the empire of Numidia in Northern Africa, 500 years after Christ. One day, our queen would be rewarding the winners of the Olympic Games. There would be 80 people. So she called her jeweler and told, her, told him the following. I want you to take this kilogram of gold and turn it to a big plate that would have the same shape as our flag, meaning triangular. In there, I want you to cut 80 identical pieces for me to reward the winners. And also, since your job is quite expensive, I would like you to keep the loss as low as possible. So our jeweler had no clue what to do. So he called Masi Nisa, the first problem solver of the Numidian Empire. Initially, Masinissa thought of a straightforward solution, basically piling up triangles that would be isosceles. So follow that. First row, one triangle. Second row, three more. Third row, five more. And fourth row, seven more. So really, how many triangles you end up piling up that way depends on how many rows you have, right? Because with two rows, you get four triangles. With three rows, you get nine triangles. And with four rows, you get 16 triangles. So the beauty of that is that you will end up summing up odd numbers up to a certain range. But this will correlate perfectly with how many rows you have. Because four is two to the power of two. Nine triangles that you get with three rows corresponds to three to the power of two. And 16 triangles is simply 4 to the power of 2. And as math is beautiful, then 1 is also 1 to the power of 2. So Masinissa understood that only a perfect square could be arranged in this way. And 80 was not a perfect square. But there's a perfect square quite close to 80. Can you guess that? Right, 81. That's 9 to the power of 2. So by piling up nine rows, it would simply get 81 triangles. So all the pieces would be identical, the big shape would be a triangle, and the loss would be one on 81. Everybody was happy, and the queen was thrilled, until the weather started changing. Because we didn't know anymore if the Olympics would be held as planned. Possibly, one game would fall off. And so the winners would be only 60 people. So now our queen changed her order and said she still wanted a big triangular plate. She wanted every winner to be rewarded with the same piece. But she wanted a cut in the plate that would be flexible, meaning that the day of the Olympics, they would be split in different ways. And now the problem got a lot trickier. So our jeweler called Masinissa again, because he's a math man, and you know, math people are very unscared, because it's like, after math happened to you, nothing worse can come around. So Masinissa took the step of just simplifying the problem, and he thought, if I would have to address it for only six versus eight winners, how should I do that? So if you had a triangle to split in this way, Obviously, you cannot split it into six pieces, because if eight people come along, then you would be too short. You cannot split it into eight pieces, because if six people come, the loss would be too much. So the idea is outside the box. This is creativity. You have to split your triangle in a number that will be greater, only divisible by six and eight. So follow that. Where do you chase such a number? Of course, crossing multiplication tables of both 6 and 8, and selecting the lower result. Ha! Huh. Because if you have 24 units in your triangle, or your whatever plate, if 6 people show up, they get 4 units each. If 8 people show up, they get 3 units each. Now to the geometrical solution. How do you even split a triangle in 24 units? Well, if you keep arithmetics in mind, it unfolds quite clearly here. 24 factorizes to 4 times 6. 
So if you start by dividing your triangle in four parts, for example, like that, and then you'd have to divide every part by six, which factorizes to two times three. So using the set of gravity of the triangle, you split it in three, and then you half each part. Quite smooth. And then you generalize this, and you get your 24 units. Now, remember, our queen wanted that, had a requirement that every winner would be rewarded with an identical piece. So now we have to come up with two arrangements. One arrangement that would be three and three on your right in case eight winners come, or four and four arrangements in case six people show up. So also again, if you can be extra careful here, you would see this, these four units could form your piece. And so that would be six individual pieces around. Perfectly congruous triangles, beautiful, starting from the gravity point of the big triangle. The other solution with the three and three arrangement would look like that. And that would give you also eight pieces that would look exactly the same. So now, remember, we still have to address the problem for 6T versus 8T people. And it doesn't look really that compelling to scale this up, does it? So the solution, again, is outside the box. The jeweler was asked to deliver 10 plates like this, and they would serve our matters, and that we just had to pile them up to actually form a big triangle like the flag. But of course, if you do that, since 10 is not a perfect square, then one plate would still be missing, and you cannot achieve your triangle this way. But 16 is the next perfect square. So if you put in holes in between, you assemble them to a nice triangle. Of course, they are golden. So you get this beautiful image. And for the holes not to be too visible, we put a golden background there. And that's where the story ends. Now, to the point of my talk, what is the reason we should learn math? Why should we practice problem solving of this type if we never come across it in life? Well, hopefully, as the example shows, math is an amazing trigger of our imaginative power. It is a great way to pinpoint our creative skills. And who does not want to become more creative? Now, of course, we could still work on our creativity and develop it by arts, music, painting, and so on. So why struggle with problem solving? And the truth is, the creativity developed by math is very distinct. See, a painting, a handcraft, arts, is just a free piece. You do whatever you want, right? Creation is free there. But whenever you deal with mathematics, you have to come up with new patterns, new solutions, but you have to obey the rules of math and also the specific requirements that your problem to solve brings with it. So what math actually targets is your conditional creativity, meaning your ability to create, taking boundaries and limitations into strong account. Now, creativity is a widely praised quality these days in personal development and our ability to live life in, a, in an exciting way and outside the box. But really, when it comes to inventing our lives instead of copying them, then what is required of us is a lot more conditional creativity, right, than free creativity. Because we do go after our goals and dreams within boundaries that could be extremely tight. Have you heard anybody around you complain about how unfulfilling life is and go, oh, I would like to set up my own business or move back to my homeland and start the project I dream of or whatever idea? And they go, if only I didn't have children, if only I had children, if only I had more money, if only I had more time, and so on. 
and they just seem to forget about it because when they hit limitations, their creative potential seems to back off and gets inhibited. And we might wonder, might wonder why it is like that. And I'm totally convinced that we're too trained to associate creativity and creation with the absence of boundaries. So math skills you for that. My name is Samia Talbi. I am a math consultant, and I boost people's creativity using math and problem-solving workshops. I am from Algeria, so I'm a proud descendant of Queen Diya and Masinissa. I ended up living and working in Sweden, which is quite the opposite, a country that is highly math critical and where large sectors of the society has very little recognition and respect for math's importance and benefits. Um, actually, just a year ago, the Swedish think tank, Tiden, was seriously arguing that math as a subject should be left out as an optional subject at elementary school level. Um, now, I do not think for a second that the problem that a non-mathematical culture could face is it, its technological future. I don't think so, because I think that even in periods or in, in circumstances where the math status is low, there's always a minority that will make it through and take the lead in terms of research and technology. Rather, and because of its relationship to creativity, I think that missing out on math training is frankly taking a huge risk of becoming the least exciting version of ourselves. Because math trains creativity, and that creativity is what makes us unique, useful, and attractive. Creativity is what we need to develop humor, empathy, and critical thinking. So what would we be without creativity? That's my question. So to end my talk, I just um, would encourage you to deal with problem solving, whether you need math and problem solving in your everyday life or not, because it will boost your conditional creativity and make you better skilled psychologically to get a success psychology in mind and go after your goals, because we do go after them within the given conditions and not when we have an absence of um, conditions and limitations. But most importantly, I would encourage you to practice math because it is such a proven way to develop a sparkling, exciting, and brave personality. Thank you all very much.